All right, and we are live. Welcome everybody to episode six of Mesa Cast after a one week hiatus. I'm super delighted to have our usual guests here, Enrico and Udo, but also to be joined by Benny Hartman, who is an engineer. He is a route setter. He is an owner and shaper for WATA and also the bouldering uh, national team coach for the Japanese team. Thank you, Benny, for joining us. Super excited to have you here. Hi. And today our, our discussion, considering we have a Colombian slash American, uh, an Italian and two Germans, and one of them which works with the Japanese team is gonna be centered heavily around the culture of climbing, both outdoors and competitively. And uh, I think just to kick things off, I wanted to talk to you, Benny, about your experience joining the Japanese team and if you can kind of take us back to the beginning and how you got involved with them. Yeah, so I already started quite a long time ago. So I, my first World Cup with the Japanese team was two, 2007 in uh, Hull in Innsbruck. Uh, but at that time, more kind of supporting the team more with like logistic stuff or uh, organizational stuff. And then, uh, yeah, and then it all started. Yeah, so step by step. And I think Udo, maybe, yeah, Udo also remembers, but at that time, the, the World Cup was not that much of a big thing than today. It was much more small, smaller teams, not, not yeah, and, uh, it's more, it was more like traveling together in the car and driving from one competition to the next. And, and nowadays with the Japanese team, we have a rental, a big coach with TV teams and everything. And the, just recently I talked with Akio because she's the only one who is uh, still active from that time. And it's, yeah, it's just an amazing journey somehow. Yeah. And it's incredible how uh, the Japanese in general, how you and the kids manage you know, because they don't have any foreign language skills, many of them. You know, it was always surprising when Japanese climbers show, actually showed up at the beginning, mm -hmm. considering how difficult it would be for them. <laughs> yeah, but honestly, most of them can speak English pretty well. But they just don't want to, yeah. Put, put yeah. a microphone into their face and ask them something very quickly. They are nervous, they don't want to, and... Sometimes it's more easy to say, huh, I don't know. So, but usually they can, they can speak English. Yeah. I'm curious. And if we you also can... try to push this a little bit also with the youth team trainings that we, uh, sometimes we have some yeah, English course or something like that. I'm curious if you can give uh, us good. a little context because from the, it seems you've been working with them for a really long time before maybe at, right now they're considered just like this monumental powerhouse in climbing, but maybe that wasn't necessarily the case, although like they were up and coming. Uh, I think if, if you could give us a little bit of context of what it was like joining in during that time with the climbers. Yeah, at that time it was much more, yeah, kind of uh, joyful hobby activity somehow. And um, then it all started, of course, Akio, she was the first woman who kind of pushed it uh, on a new level. So uh, talking about bouldering, because in lead we already in, in Japan we had the uh, Yuji Hirayama, but for the for the bouldering it was Akio. She was the first Japanese who made it to a podium, who who won a World Cup and so on. And, but she uh, was already uh, third place in in lead in Munich, uh, 05. Before, hmm? she had the podium in lead in 05 already. Akio. Yes, yeah, yeah. She her, her background was from lead, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but then I, now I'm just talking about the bouldering team. She, she was okay. one with the first success and uh, who also created a kind of media attention for the for the bouldering in Japan. And then it got more kind of more popular. And then from the man, it was then um, Tsukuru Hori. Um, he was the first Japanese to win a World Cup. And this was 2011 in Kenmore. And after Tsukuru, then we had Koko Fuji, Rei Sukimoto, and then it kind of exploded when Tomoa was winning in the World Championships in, in Paris. And um, so it was, of course, with every development in a sport in a country, of course, you need some media attention. 
which was beginning generated with Akio and her success. And then you need other climbers to kind of uh, yeah, take the flame and kind of push it even more. So it was kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, process of making the sports more popular and bringing in more people to, to try it and um, yeah, to build, build it up. Yeah, because I mean, at this and point, now since, since I, uh, uh, since 2000 and I think 14 or 15, so we are, yeah, 2014, we, there was the first year we won the overall, uh, like the national team ranking in bouldering and since then every year. So it's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think what's incredible and to me and for a lot of people is like the depth of the Japanese team, uh, like especially if you watch, you know, competitions like the Japan World uh, Boulder Cup, where like you see some climbers that you wouldn't necessarily see in the World Cups, but you just you're like, oh, man, they're just as good as the rest of the team. Um, I think the cultural conversation comes to a lot of people frequently ask themselves, there's like, what do they have? What's in the water? Like, what is the key that, you know, that they know that we don't know? And I think you have a ton of insight into it. And so I'm curious to your thoughts is like, is there something what, like, is it cultural? Is it because they had some pioneers in the sport? Like, what do you think led to that success? Yeah, everybody want to know. So it, it Honestly, we have one, one exercise, it just lasts one minute, it's super easy, and you do it once per week, and that's it. So, there you go, is, perfect, we heard it. Not, there is not, nothing like that, you know, of course, mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot of dedication, and uh, a lot of things are based in, in cultural uh, backgrounds, like putting in hard work, continue, for example, in, in Japan, you talk about Kaizen, this is, means a continuous process, which step by step increase and get, gets better. And they're willing to put into the, uh, in all the effort, which is necessary to reach this highest level of mastery. And, um, and yeah. And, and would you, would you say coming as a German into that, like, how was it different from you know, being a German coaching a Japanese team, like how did they contrast? What are some things that you brought that maybe they didn't have culturally? Of, of course, there are many <laughs> things which are a little bit different, but the funny thing was when I started, I did not think about that at that time. So it just started and there were some kind of strange situations or awkward situations. And then later, um, because at that time I was still a student, and uh, I, uh, then later I did a master degree in innovation and product management. And there was one, one uh, subject called uh, intercultural communication. And when we, when you had this subject, so I was reading through the script and I was like, ah, oh, okay, now it makes sense, you know? <laughs> so, um, so it was, of course, a learning process for me, for them. Um, just to give you an example, when I started with doing a, a a little bit competition analysis and competition feedback. First, I started in very structural, straight way, like a little bit more German way. So, okay, this was good, this was bad, and we are not such a big team, so let's sit together and discuss it. So, this was your mistake, let's talk about it. And of course, this does not work, you know, because you do talk about bad things in front of others, and there is no bad thing. And just to, to as some kind of takeaway, since then, in my um, competition feedback, I always have good points and I have improvement potential because this is something we should uh, think about as a coach. So um, the athletes, what they are doing when they are on the stage, when they are competing, they are always trying to give their best point. So, and if they're making something, let's say stupid, yeah, in the end, this was the best option they could see at that moment, you know, and then we should always keep in mind. So, and if we give feedback, we should give it in a positive way. Yeah. If we see something like that, this is kind of improvement potential. So how can we make sure that next time you're in the kind of same situation that you can react better and do the thing which has a better chance of a yeah, top or good outcome or whatever. So this is something which I really like from this kind of way of thinking which I, of course, also, yeah, kind of educated me or which I could learn from that, yeah. And Udo, you've worked with the Japanese team a bit. Did you? Yeah, 
shift a little bit that way whenever you've had to work with them? Like uh, the Japanese team? In terms of just, just like how you, like, like, I think that's really interesting to me that, you know, the way that you gave feedback kind of changed and it, it sounds like positively towards something where you, you know, you just but do it in general. The, the communication with the athlete is uh, the trickiest part. You know, it's the bottleneck for what we are doing. And if we uh, know what, what uh, Benny was uh, describing is really that, that you need, you cannot confront people. You now you need some openness you know, and some uh, buy-in. That is interesting what you, what you talk about. And this is really uh, difficult to do, very tricky. And uh, uh, everybody's different too. All, every athlete has a way of better communicating or, or not communicating at all. And it's very individual and also very situational. So that's really, and, and plus, and I think what it, it can be a total advantage because my story with the Germans was a little bit like Benny's with the Japanese and so far, and I wasn't an insider. I came pretty much from the outside. I didn't know me before in this context. And, and so, and you get away with a lot of uh, uh, stuff and uh, that um, also makes you authentic. You know, even if they uh, are afraid of, uh, even if they wouldn't really call you a good coach, and they might be intimidated or puzzled by you, you still, uh, uh, you know, you still realize that it's you that is talking, you know, and just it doesn't have a better way of communicating. Yeah, and right. I think this was also when, when I started um, with a team manager at that time was uh, Kazuhiro Chiba. And then sometimes I could bring up things which are hard for him. Because if I say something which is kind of, um, yeah, difficult to talk about then they can say ah, okay this is Benny it's crazy he's, he's a little bit yeah. crazy but it's okay and that is still with some of the athletes when I bring up something it's ah, Benny what are you you know but anyway I you know they know that in in my let's say with my cultural background in Germany this is kind of normal oh it's okay to talk about it and if I bring it up it's okay Somehow. Yeah. And if, within the Japanese coaches, you probably also decide who talks to what, uh, which athlete. No, because uh, it, usually before the comp, when we have the start lists, so we go through, look at the timing, and then, um, like I mentioned when we when you talked earlier, sometimes it's quite hard because um, you have a big bulk of people climbing at the same time in qualifications or in semifinal. So we have to split and make sure that you can, uh, yeah manage or understand and also you know as a coach it's it's always like with this person you have a really good connection so it's better this what i meant I yes. speak to him or it's better than the other coach he yeah uh, they have better relationships so he he can handle it so it's yeah it always sometimes depends. even the athletes tell you which voice they like most for, for the for the occasion no which or which they hear which voice during the competition. Yeah, yeah, even during the competition or uh, like, like just for encouragement or uh, like this, you know, or which... Uh... It's, quite, it's quite funny, but, um, you know, in competition is always performing under stress and it's really individual. Some athletes, they cannot hear anything. After the yeah. comp, I did not hear anything. And some people, they really can spot different voices or they hear suddenly some some strange sound from the street or whatever it's kind of amazing so how the focus can completely close so that you cannot um, get any sensory input from the acoustics or not so it's yeah but this is yeah. a little bit different story then yeah I wanted to ask you Enrico kind of going through to shifting cultures altogether because Enrico you were you work for Mesa now but you came to set uh from Italy, and you had mentioned that you hadn't been here necessarily before climbing. Uh, I, like, what was your first kind of impressions coming to the U.S. different from a climbing perspective? And if we can we can just talk about gyms right now if you want, just like overall. I was a little bit laughing while Benny was talking about the different culture because it's pretty much what I live. I would say every day, you know, coaching at Mesa or setting at Mesa. And of course, when I travel around in the U.S. for setting or 
when I was in Japan for setting. It's kind of, you know, the coolest part is that you can take a little bit of advantage from being from another culture because it's almost a lot. Every time is allowed to you to do almost whatever you want, you know, in terms of, of course, as a coach is my nature, uh, but it's my culture too. We are pretty sarcastic. We try to, you know, be every time positive. We kid around, we kid a lot when we talk, when we coach, when we push athletes. And so, you know, at the beginning here in the US for sure was a little bit weird. And sometimes I was acting a little bit, you know, probably in a weird way, consider the, the culture, but because, you know, it's, it's kind of is my way, our way. And of course, again, luckily you can, uh, you can push a little bit because you have an excuse, you know, and I'm totally with Udo about, I think, being yourself every time, because of course, you know, people are going to understand you, that you are from another culture. And so maybe you are acting a little bit weirdly for this reason. And second part, you cannot expect to adapt too much. And so it's better to be yourself and go straight and take a look what's happening. And then of course, adjust a little bit. And of course, you know, when I show up here about the setting uh, and, you know, I think uh, I, I was surprised at the beginning how my setting was so, let's say, different and, you know, uh, completely, uh, yeah, a little bit stepping out from the rest of the setting because I was not thinking about doing nothing weird. And I remember that, yeah, one thing uh, I learned the first time I was here at Mesa is that there was a kind of the rating for the routes, just, hey, give you as a customer your opinion. And, uh, and uh, on all my routes at the beginning, most of the time someone was writing down awkward, awkward. And with my bad English, I was kind of, what does it mean awkward? Try to, and it's kind of weird, awkward. I mean. What they are talking about is just right, left, right, left. Yeah, a couple of cross. You have just to balance a little bit. There's no feet. Of course, you don't need feet and foot match and, you know, smear. So, and then I figured it out that, you know, a very, for me, simple, inviting, straightforward route was involving so much different climbing, let's say, skills or movements than regular and then of course you know taking a deeper look on the setting and taking a look underneath every single holds there were two three feet option that is kind of for me for me i would say in general for setting in i would say pretty much in italy or in europe you know you don't have a lot of option because you don't need option you need to do certain moves or as the setters we want to force movement and so yeah that's that was for me the, the first very big uh, impact because I was not thinking about doing nothing crazy. I was not pushing at all my style and was kind of already a little bit different, you know, and, uh, and uh, requiring for some point of view, uh, again, different skills. And, and it's something that, for example, blow, blew my mind when, I, when I, I was in Japan last year setting at B pump uh, because that kind of concept there is uh, is very very pushed you know there's we were talking before with Benny there's nothing really not easy in terms of difficult there's no very easy way to climb in the climbing gym in Japan so every time you climb on something you need to involve Climbing skills, you need to involve movement. I would say you have to climb. You cannot really just go up. You know, it's not about just, oh, I'm going up. You have to climb. And, and this is happening since the very, very easiest problem. And so I think this is making a huge difference uh, climbing wise because make Japanese climbers already kind of climbing since the beginning since the easiest level so they are already solving problems since the very beginning you know and uh, and this is their way 
to, I think it's their concept of accessibility is just an easy climb overall, but you need to climb. And uh, is, is a huge difference with the uh, US and I think Europe too, because uh, mm. I think in Europe we are getting better too in, in make the climb more accessible in terms of we can go up, but there's less climbing skills involved. There's a huge difference for me between the, the three countries, you know. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I think this is also a big, this can be a big difference because, because when you start climbing, of course you start with these easy things. And if you have your first three colors, it's just like more or less letters where you just pull and you have success with it, you think this is climbing, you know. But if you from the start need to kind of take care of your body position, of your movement, and kind of, it's already a challenge just to understand, find a solution. This is a quite a different approach to climbing. And I think that the best of the best climbers, usually they are also the best when it comes to basic movements. And I think this is a little bit, the question is, when you, when you, who is the best climber? What, what, what is your goal as a climber, you know? Just to, to look good and look strong or just to be very efficient kind of, yeah, technically elegant climber, you know? And in, um, in many, and nowadays, quite a lot of people come, to, uh, they switch from like more fitness style to, to bouldering or to climbing. And um, of course, as a commercial gym, you want to offer them some success, some tops so that they say, yes, I did it and they come 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 back again to your gym just to get your business running but is this kind of um, a step stone to making them a better climber or not and um, this is just a question is it what is more worth uh, the the top or solving a very technical move and can you get enough how to say happiness or joy from just can you get joy only from the top or can you get some joy from solving a, a move or something like that. And are you willing to put in the effort to do it? And I think Enrico, you already saw that when you go to Japan, you can see so many people, also old people, 40, 50 years, sorry, Udo. Um, <laughs> but trying yeah, really hard on projects. <laughs> I know, you know, Udo, next year he has his uh, 40th birthday or something, I think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is the thing. Are you willing to go as hard as you can? You know, and this is in Japan, of course, from the cultural side, especially from the men. If you if you go, go one hundred percent. But I think, but I, I think really a difference uh, is this kaizen uh, uh, yeah. thinking. Mm. You know that, per, like it's much more ingrained into a society that's about the process. So even if it's, mm. uh, when it's about hard climbing, you still accept that it will be a process. There will, won't be a magic pill. You know, you're not leapfrogging any uh, obstacle, you know, but you have to deal with it. And, uh, and so I think from early on, you're practicing problem solving to a higher degree than you do in, uh, for now in, in most other countries in yeah. climbing. Yeah, and, and I think again, for my little experience there, uh, I'm, I'm totally with you though about the problem solving, of course. So it's kind of, uh, you know, I think uh, is uh, the country and they have a culture in which problem solving is, is pretty, you know, is, is the base because they have three alphabets, you know, everything is more. So there's a lot of, I think they, they have a, a lot of art involved every time and they polish a lot of, you know, they, they polish everything. And, uh, and so again, I was talking with Benny. For me, it was crazy, for example, just about eating, you know, we have a, in Italy, we have a pretty big culture about food, but uh, it's very simple. You know, when you take a look on a, uh, on a kind of a table with a lot of different cups from Japan, there's a lot of different things to do. It's very complicated. It's kind of, you know, 
and and they are already used to do since the beginning because it's, it's very and and moving into the climbing i think for example one thing was uh, i was really appreciating and was really cool for me is that of course there's the the cult of success too because I think when you interact with the climbing problem of course you want to start from the start and reaching the top when you go outside when you climb outside you want to mantle and top the boulder problem when you you want to clip the chain and then of course we have this mindset and these rules relate to our success but there I was finding a lot of passion about solving every single movement first and then put them together for the let's say climbing success but mm -hmm. if you if you that it's a part of the climbing that i really like for myself personally too i want to solve a movement and then of course i want to put together the movements because in that mm -hmm. way i can learn something you know it's not only about oh i top this problem kind of shaking everywhere, just happen a miracle. I didn't understand the move at all. So it's not a learning experience. I think Japanese, uh, they have this culture of polishing every single move, learning mm. from every single move. And, and then this is just making them better climber, you know? Mm. Because it's, it's, I, I would say it's, it's more about value of the detail. So you really value all the details. May it be in the tea ceremony, how you just turn it or how you place the dish or whatever. It's always value about the detail and the same thing in climbing. And um, this is also something which, because um, already we talked with uh, Udo about uh, Tsukuru Hori. He was the first Japanese to win a World Cup. But with him, I also, in the, in the beginning, I had quite a super, super interesting discussion once. So, because we were watching another climber and I was discussing about the, the move and why, what, what's the problem. But then school just said, but look, look at the ankle position, you know? And I was like, hey, why? Because this blocks that. Da, 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 da. And since then I'm this kind of, um, yeah, was so kind of, how to say, this bit on point, you know, value the detail. Sometimes it's just a small detail, the ankle position. And because of that, you cannot turn the knee and because of that he cannot jump you know but take the time to look at the details and work on the details and that's what i mentioned earlier the best are also the best in the basics you know and you have to have the technique from the beginning in a very precise way and then you can gradually Move like over. we said with the kaizen step by step upwards but the thing is that, that the basics are not cool and everybody want to be cool. And it's much more cool than to, to pull out a, a, a one-arm pull-up or something like that, because yeah. the girls okay. like it more. I don't know. But, but this is a good segue. Kind of May I ask question, a question? Technical night climbing and show-off climbing. May I ask uh, something I would be really interested in, and what's your opinion about social media? How does social media play even into the Japanese team? Um, I. It, it plays a role in different ways. One, one thing is with the language. The other thing is that the Japanese climbers are much more visible now than in the past, because in the past they wrote some Japanese blogs, but nobody could read it. And nowadays, you know, well, there are so many super strong climbers like Shinjiro Nomura, who can hang on a super small crimp, which is just impossible with one arm. And these kind of things, yeah. So on, on the other hand, it also has a kind of cultural effect because in the, in, from yeah, my experience, of course, if you're a, a Japanese man and you are in front of a crowd and you're performing and showing your skills, everybody expects that you give 100% and of course they will go out and they will try 110% and they will kind of die on the stage. But from the cultural thing that the, um, in each culture, you have also the role from men and women, and the, the woman in Japan is just a little bit more, I don't know the right word, but shy or more in the background. And I think that um, with social media, of course, also this kind of things changed. And now I'm with the team since quite a long time, and um, the younger generation is much more open and 
pushy. And from the Japanese side, I think also Miho had a big effect because Miho is not the traditional Japanese girl. She's much more like a little bit boy-like character and more kind of character which you which is kind of good for bouldering because in bouldering you have to go in and sometimes hurt yourself but don't care and keep fighting you know and this is not the kind of traditional girl way japanese way and uh, i think because of that the, the social media had quite an effect um, one thing in my limited experience when i went to japan and i basically i was just traveling around with my wife and trying to go to as many gyms as possible like the thing that stood out to me the most climbing in the bouldering gyms was the fact that like all of the climber shins were really uh, bruised and and scarred like it was really and that's something that at the academy similarly in in Mesa, it's like very clear of, oh, this is high risk climbing. Like you slip, you hit your shin on a volume, but like every single person had it. It wasn't like, oh, just the competitive climbers had that. It was everybody. And to me, it was just like, if that happens sometimes in a commercial gym, if you hit your shin and, and on a boulder problem in a commercial gym, I think generally here, some people be like, screw that boulder problem. I'm going to a different one. But that was for me all like a really interesting, cause it was like almost like clearly you tried it and then you kept trying it and like uh it was that in combination with the setting just things positions of holds were what would be considered uncomfortable here like you you wouldn't see like a pinch kind of facing away from you up into this shoulder position and to me that was like it, it, it's we've been talking about these like communication cultural differences but even just you can feel it in the climbing and for people they're setting it, it's just like the value of how they see climbing and what's comfortable and what's not comfortable it was very different and I took that back and I was like this is I like that a lot like that was something that I really appreciated yeah I I totally agree I think it's was very yeah was very interesting for me too of course you know uh working back in Italy and then in the US and then show up in Japan and see, you know, no big deal about, you know, uh, same uh, kind of two different problems with the red holes, dark red, bright red, no problem. They can stay together because yeah, of course, customer, they're gonna understand, they're not gonna complain. And then, oh, but this, this all this sticking out too much, don't worry. Then uh, they're gonna climb around and if they're gonna, eat the hold, no problem. If, so it's kind of, if you do a mistake and if you don't move properly, you're gonna get punished, it's not a big deal. So I was very surprised about um, how kind of, uh, we're more based on try to create a, a, a nice learning climbing experience with, without thinking too much about the comfort, but just, hey, we are here for training, for trying hard, for learning how um, to move, you know, and uh, and and again, I think it's something that we were talking a little bit before. Uh, this is fun for me because at some point they they were uh, um, we were setting and they were asking us, oh, can you set a couple of other problems, kind of V eight ish uh, for uh, uh, Kokoro and, and me? I was thinking. B7, B8 for Kokoro, sorry, Kokoro who? Because of course I was not thinking about setting B7, B8 for a, a World Cup a competitor, a winner, athlete. But of course it was for Kokoro Fuji and say, oh, okay, what does it mean B7, B8? I should set B13. And so because of course the B7, B8, they are pretty hard in Japan, but again, not because to me, in my mind, not because they are sandbag, but because they want to push the sport. And so kind of the climbing is hard, but not in terms of the grade. It's hard in terms of you need to learn how to climb. You need to work on your details. You need to polish them. And then you can become a better climber. So it doesn't matter if it's B3, B5, B9, because the coolest part for me is that you step in the climbing gym in Japan, and you have already to start climbing since the beginning. You need to be a climber and you need to know the basic and, and then you can start moving higher 
in the grades, but they are not very important because again, you can see a lot of climbers spending time, spending effort and try, try hard, not complain, just polishing the movements, the details. Mm. But for example, fine. for example, when you're talking about polishing, the thing is, I think this is also something Udo cares about is learning new movements. And the thing is, if there is a boulder, I don't know, with, with some kind of technique I've never done before, how long do I try it since, until I, I reach the top the first time? Because if I, then I can say, yeah, I did it and keep going and try something else. Or do I kind of repeat this boulder? Because then the real learning starts. Because then you get step by step, you know the movement, but you get more precise. You And during multiple, um, uh, how to say, re repetitions, then you really become good at something. You know, it's not just like one time and I did it and now I can do it. This is not mastery, you know. If you want to be a true master in something, you have to repeat it multiple times. And, and also what you're learning, I think what's more, even more important for, especially for boulder competition, is you learn how to learn movements. That's even, the, in my mind, the more, most valuable skill because this is what, what they are asked to do. You know, they, they might never ever done exactly that move. So ultimately mm. it's about being really proficient in learning this move within the five, four or five minutes they have. Mm. And, uh, and this yeah. is again, like there are many competitors that don't really practice this process all that often. Mm. I think the cool thing about, I guess, going back this goes back to the beginning when you were talking about essentially what the climbers value when they come into the gym or when they're doing their training session i think there are some whether it's cultural or not there are some people where they come into the gym if they didn't climb a new boulder then it was a failure even if they spent you know two hours uh learning a new move and got better and like started progressing towards learning new movement if they never climbed a new boulder then it was time wasted and that's something that i see frequently in some athletes it's like they really have a really hard time because it was like during this session i couldn't climb a single new boulder but from my perspective i watched them like grow as and their ability to perform these different movements and i think that's something that's that's very different And it sounds like that's kind of what you're saying with the Japanese team. You know, if, if you're valuing these, uh, like I, something that I wanted to take back when I came back from Japan, I remember really clearly talking to kind of the head setter and saying, you know, the low end is much higher. And he was like, well, if we raise the low end, then people aren't going to be able to climb boulders. And I'm like, but does that really matter? Even if we have them spend an, an hour and a half, if we can get them at least to learn to like spending an hour and a half on one climb, and that's what they value. And whether they get success or not, like them through that process, that's like what they see as like a good practice. I think that's an amazing, you know, shift. And that's kind of like the shift that we've been going towards. And I think it's awesome. It's like a really different way of measuring, you know, whether the practice is being successful or not, but it takes time because it's not really, it's, it's not the default. I would say here, the default is, did you climb a boulder? Yes. Okay. Then your practice was good, you know, but, and, and I'm with you all because I think, uh, you know, it's pretty, I would say it's pretty similar everywhere. And I'm still thinking that The success, we are still measuring the success with the number of tops, with the numbers of, you know, uh, routes you do. But because we are still too much connect with rock climbing, because no one is going back from a climbing session outside and say, oh, today was a great day because I was so close to do my project outside or I was falling two moves before the jug on my route, you know. We are still measuring, oh, I did it or not, success or not. And so we, we bring sometimes this mindset on the climbing gym or on the, on the session with the athletes. But I think the, the future and is more important about being focused on the learning experience. How much did you learn? Because in the end, they are just piece of tape on, uh, on the wall. Uh, and when you practice, it's more important to learn the new moves and new movements for getting better. And then of course, if you're gonna put together a lot of movements, 
probably you're going to succeed on a boulder problem. And if you're going to learn how to learn while climbing, then you're going to adapt in every single situation anytime. But, but I would argue almost like maybe in outdoor climbing, it, t it tends to be a little bit more like uh, you have a long standing project where, I, I mean, for me, I would be there for six years in the same boulder and I would just be excited if like one, one time I finally did the crux of the boulder, you know, like, I think maybe that's a little different. That can be, or I can be a little different. Because I think you are passionate about movements because other people, they don't project for six years if they're not passionate about a movement you know maybe they're passionate about the grade so is the ego but if you're passionate about the movement you can be passionate about a movement in a climbing gym outside whatever you know but of course i think is of course i think a, a very important thing culturally is to learn how to for my side from my side is just how to appreciate just learning single movements and just find them on a wall and climb, have fun, explore yourself moving, not really thinking about, I have to start here sitting, I have to talk, and then it's going to be a su successful, you know, practice. Yeah, I, think it's, I think it's, um, of course, you know, in each culture, in each country, you have a great variety of people and characters. And it's, it's not like black and white, there is always gray. But in general, I would say, of course, you need to be ambitious, you know? Of course, you need to have high goals, yeah? But if you only measure your success when you reach the goal, it can be quite uh, tiring, you know? And then it comes in that you have to appreciate the process. And I think also with this kind of, yeah, amb ambition and also passion is, for example, one really cool movie of Daiko Yamada. I, I don't know, maybe you have seen it with um, uh, when he when he climbed the story of Two World and then they said the wrong start and everything. Watch this video because then you can really see how passionate you can be about something, you know, and value the process of going there and then finally succeeding. Because this is, yeah, I think something quite cool. Yeah, that was a great. Speaking of diet, I think one of the, back to the social media aspect because of what you're saying. I remember back in the day going into his blog, and I had no obviously I couldn't read Japanese, so I would just like hit Google Translate, and it wasn't very good. But I would just love watching the videos and then just trying to decipher like the, the translation. But now, I mean, like that video to me stands out so much, like you said, about like the whole, oh, this isn't the wrong start. And he started it upside down and like just the the process of that. And you could tell, but, and it's how it shifted for the social media now where they're like, they're in the spotlight so heavily now, because at this point, like they could post a video of themselves doing like anything mm -hmm. out you know, some sort of hang and then everybody will be like, okay, is that the secret? Like, that's what we need to be doing. <laughs> Stop doing exactly what we're doing right now. And we're going to do this instead. <laughs> and that's crazy. That's like such a shift from kind of being in the background. And I think that's really cool because it lets you, you know, if, if other people, if you're not getting kind of that feedback from social media all the time, it lets you develop your process without it being necessarily kind of like affected by that. Um, and and but it's such a such a dynamic shift, um, and I'm curious like how they deal. Going back to Miho, and you were saying, okay, her attitude was very like different, and it was really useful for bouldering, and kind of elaborating a little bit more of like the impact of social media and like developing their culture for for competition. <clears throat> Like for example, do do your athletes see something on social media they want to try out that some competitors have been doing? Yeah, of course. I think nowadays okay. with all these kind of challenges going on, and Udo, you know, in the World Cup circuit, there are friendships around the globe, and <clears throat> I know always that, for example, Yoshiyuki and some of the Israel guy like uh, Ram Levin, they always. I can do that, you can do that, do, 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 and so on, or with Chong Won Chon, and uh, he also spends quite a lot of time usually training in Japan. And if he can try something, oh, did you see what Chong Won Chon was doing, you know? Of course, yeah. 
it's almost like psychological warfare before anything even happens. <laughs> but I think this, this this kind of psychological warfare, I, I really remember. So when the whole social media thing started, <clears throat> do you remember the, the pinky front lever from uh, Rustam Germanov? Yeah. 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 I, because it was this a, not, like in 2010 or 2011. Yeah. Because when, when everyone is, wow, Rustam is just so, so super strong. And, and I remember it because Coco said, yeah, but I can do it too. <laughs> just, yeah. but, but this is when this kind of challenges uh, thing started, you know? Yeah. 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 But I, I, I think it's harming some of them. Not everybody is there. There are winners and losers. You know, people that uh, use uh, social media to their advantage, not even in a bad way. I don't mean it in a bad way, but they can somehow uh, put things into perspective and don't mm. get too distracted. And uh, but I think I would almost be afraid to say, call it the majority is uh, is not benefiting. Yeah. No, like even Sean, is this even a short test or will it make you a better climber? And most of the yeah, time, yeah. I, I think like the, the, like if, if I put this in like uh, time wise, I think when Chong started to be part of these challenges, it was when he when things didn't go too well for him. I just I one know. example, you it's know. Just, I, 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 the, yeah, I can, I can tell. It's just guessing. I don't know. Yeah, I I I, I think some, some <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's definitely an issue. Well, it's I think there is many many things in the in the background which we can guess or not but for example there was also for example for Chong Won Chon if you remember the um, the Asian games um, at that time it was two years ago three years ago um, that at that time it was about if he can win this thing he does not he he doesn't need to go to the um, military service ah so this was a super big goal for him and when he won it it kind of gave him like uh, almost two years of his life you know <laughs> and then maybe yeah. after that his kind of uh 100 focus a little bit away i don't know but you can see it with some of the i think i, I just get just guessing but with some of the the russian climbers the same so if you're super hungry to give everything you have because almost your life depends on it, you know, then you're willing to, to put everything in. And with some climbers, I can see as soon as they kind of settle their life and find a kind of comfortable place to stay or whatever, then this kind of little la the last edge is kind of going away. And then of course the, the performance decrease. But this is something which I have to say, there is one climber who absolutely sticks out of this is uh, Akio. Because she's just, I know Udo is a really big fan of her, <laughs> but she's, she's on top of the game since so, so long time. And this is one of her, how to say, this is her character is just to keep pushing as hard as she can. And in a very, very, very professional way. And I really value this because the root setting style changed in a way which is not beneficial for her. And at that uh, kind of age, it's super hard to develop these kind of skills, but she's willing to put in everything it needs. And um, even now, of course, you're uh, locked down and it's hard for some athletes to find motivation during this time just to keep up the training and use this kind of time in a valuable way to progress. But um, yeah, just yesterday I talked with her and she is still on fire. And I, this is just incredible. So I, I, yeah, I have so much respect for her as the kind of, she's just a prototype of professional athlete, I would say, yeah. <laughs> which you as, wish to have you. Yeah. And I, I would, yeah. what I wanted to ask you about that is, you know, we're talking about the culture aspect, but also just obviously there's like a leader. She's a leader. How do you think that affects the rest of the team? Like, you know, the rest of the team, I imagine, looks up to her and like that's, you know, helping them develop that characteristic that you're talking about. Would you say that that's like helping that? Yeah, I think this is this is maybe another topic which is kind of culturally um, founded is when you look at culture, there is one um, parameter which can be 
in, in different parts. This is always the individual versus the community. And um, there is two countries who are the, how to say the endpoints of the scale is Japan and US. And in US, the focus is always on the individual or mostly. And in Japan, the group is more important than the individual. And I think this is something which you can also see in competition climbing. There were always some single athletes from the US, but that the, there is a, the growing of a, a, a team, a national team is just recently also with uh, Josh and pushing this kind of that. I can, now I can see some kind of team growing up. And in Japan, it's always different. So we always, I think we have a really good team spirit. And I was a little bit afraid uh, when it came to the Olympic decisions and uh, to the quota with two per country. I was a little bit afraid that there will, this will create a little bit harder fight inside our team. And I yeah, try to yeah, keep this kind of team spirit. And this, I think, worked because of the cultural background in Japan. And um, just to give one extreme example of this kind of team spirit is you all know with uh, uh, when Fukushima happened. And um, I remember that day because I was talking with a team manager and he, he just said, oh, did you hear there was a, a earthquake in Japan, a really big one? I was like, yeah, yeah. And then he said, yeah, he was at that time he was talking um, with school on the phone. And he said, he's at, because he's close to Sendai at that time, because his parents live close to Sendai, he's on the coastline and he's trying to move away from the sea now. And then we could not connect, uh, contact him like two days. So, and um, and then we at that time we said, okay, no problem. Uh, whoever from team wants, book a flight to Europe, and we will find a place for you to stay in Vienna. And nobody accepted the offer, even from from Tokyo, because they all said, here in Tokyo we are not. It, it, the situation is not as hard as up in the north. So if we leave now. What kind of image will this create for the rest of the of the team or from the from the national? And honestly, if you say in in US there is a nuclear uh, catastrophe, yeah, and you say, okay, come over, I will take everybody will be first look for himself and maybe his family and just go. Nobody will care for the for the all of the community. And this, I think this is something which is a really big difference that in Japan the group and the team is really important even if bouldering is just a kind of uh, individual sport, but I think we have a, a really good team spirit and the people, they push each other in the training. And I think this is a really, really important point because if you work together in a good way and push each other in a positive way, this, then you can get the growth. And in, when it comes to bouldering, in each kind of style, we have somebody who is more or less the world best yeah, when it comes to slab climbers, when it comes to dynamic boulders, when it comes to pure power compression boulders, when it comes to crimps. And when we have a, a, a team competition or team training and we put up some really hard boulder, I'm pretty sure oh, I'm always sure that somebody will do it. And in other national teams and in other trainings, I know that if you put a super hard slab and nobody can do it, then you can always say, ah, this is just impossible. It's, yeah. And in, and in our team, somebody will do it, and then you can say, "Okay, this this is the way." Now, just try harder. <laughs> Kata will do it. Yeah, for example, yeah. this lab. Yeah. Awesome. But yeah, but this is always the thing. Yeah, if you have a good group with different skills who push each other, this is just the best. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna shift gears a little bit because I wanted to get touch on some other parts. So you are a hold shaper. And mm -hmm. I think as we talked a little bit, even I think culturally there's even differences if you go US to Europe and, and the style of holds and like the quality of the holds, it, not quality so much in like how it's made, but like the quality of like in cut versus, you know, not super in cut. Uh, and so shaping for Wata, like how has that kind of changed over the years to help guide your coaching and your setting to, you know, develop these better athletes? Yeah, I think one of the things is, um, I, I'm all, also a little bit kind of uh, perfectionist, so I always want to make it 
And uh, before studying sports equipment technology and so on, I worked as a model builder and I did an apprenticeship in model building. And at that time I um, was working for a company um, who was um, doing all the prototypes and stuff and show cars. And I'm originally from the Southwest of Germany and there are some companies like Porsche, Mercedes, and we did the show at that time, we built the show cars for these companies. And of course you need to be, it does not need to be like even, the light lines need to be perfect. And this is kind of thing which I was always uh, pushed to be perfect with these things. And this is something also on the water holes, if the, the I would say level from the double texture from, to the to the foam part, uh, foam part structure, is need to be even. So I really value this kind of details. And this is maybe a little bit German Japanese style thing. And on the other thing, the kind of simple aesthetics, which is also um, kind of, yeah, and the, the modular thing. And the, well, what comes from the um, competition route setting is the thing that at that time, many times I, we did the observation also of route or something. And I remember Sachi, ah, I know this whole, at that point it's good. I know this whole, at that time it's good. And at that time I started thinking, honestly, this is just about the athletes they need to get the newest hold and they need to know the hold. And this is, honestly, this is not real on-site climbing for me because I, I'm living close to Frankenthur and you can, you can observe a route, but you will never know if this hold is good or not. And because of that, uh, in Vata, we have many holds, which kind of from below look almost the same. So now I, I know that from, from the Japanese team, many people, they, for competition state, as an athlete, they don't like the holes that much because they, they know the whole set, but they don't know which hold of the set it is. And it's real outside climbing, in my opinion, especially in lead, because then you know, okay, I know it, but I, I don't know. And then you need to have alternative plans, also in observation, that you have to know, okay, is it possible, it's not. And then during climbing, then you have to decide quite quickly. Um, which solution you want to try when you arrive at this kind of position. And, um, and then you can see if it's a good climber, an experienced climber or not. Because if you're not experienced and if you're not self-confident enough and if you don't want to take risks and want to play safe, in World Cup route, you will, usually you will lose because there is no kind of easy resting position. Every time you hesitate, every time you take too much time of thinking for thinking you will usually lose power and this is something quick decision making and um, self-confident climbing and relying on your skills even in if you're in a really really stressful situation and i think this is quite important in competition climbing and that was the reason why we have so many sets which kind of look a little bit the same in the competition line and which you also can play with in a modular way because then you can create something which the climber cannot expect and cannot know. And then you cannot, can create this kind of situations more, more easy as a root setter. Yeah. I think that's really cool because I, I haven't, uh, talking to other shapers, I haven't really seen that perspective a ton. I think most shaper, like for instance, we were talking about Cheetah last time and uh, with Flo and he was mentioning like, you know, if you're trying to set something and at the time you're like, I really want this hold, but I can't set it because of we don't have it. So let's make it. And uh, it's a little more interesting because like from you, I hadn't really heard that very uh, at all really is from the perspective of the game and making the game a little bit different, like for the perspective of the athlete and the decisions making that they have to make, which is cool. I like, um, it's just that. And of course, for the, for the root setting side, of course, nowadays you need a directional holds which you have not which you cannot use the thumb because then you have the directional force you can put on the hold with a thumb is much wider the angle where you can put in the force but without the thumb it's just more limited and then it can be much more precise for the root setting and if you have the same hold in kind of different angles or whatever you can just play a little bit better or just change the angle a little bit and adapt it and this was the the whole idea why we uh, from the early stage on put a lot of effort into the all these kind of slippery double texture things and, yeah. and i really yeah. like we we were talking about it i really like the the concept that uh, is cool through the shaping 
and through the right uh, shapes and holds to make still the athletes comfortable because they they know the holes they you know is what i call inviting for them is kind of oh i know what i have to do but then of course they have still to to climb when they are on to make decision because of course they can be slightly different than expected and so i i really i really like from the the coaching and the setting perspective to work with holds that you know they're kind of easy and simple to understand and so through the setting you can make athletes comfortable and say okay i know what to do but then you can still surprise them where they're going to be on the wall because you can play with, with the holds and make their life a little bit harder so you can have both you know uh, because i think you have to make athletes comfortable too and you know because it's hard to step in the stage and uh, compete and so have the pressure so if they have something that can reinforce their uh, you know their ego their attitude they can feel uh, comfortable and confident but then at the same time you can challenge them you know i think is is very is very cool and and is keeping the soul of climbing mm -hmm. that is adapt and make decision and go over you know without yeah. And I, I, I think the, the thing with root setting and competition climbing, it's always, <clears throat> of course, the root setters want the athletes to succeed, but not everybody in the first try and not everybody, if all of them fail, it's also hard. And uh, one thing is always if you surprise them somehow and put them under stress. And I, I remember one boulder in World Championship in Paris um, the, the first first world championship in Paris, I think Udo, maybe you remember, and there was in 2012. Yeah, and then there was 2012 the, to the right side. It looked like an easy shoulder move with this kind of foothold. And when yeah. I looked at the ball from from the coaching seat, I thought it's an easy one. And then later everybody struggled like super hard on that one. Yeah, and I remember that later I was talking. I thought, why did they, why did you not just uh, commit and go for it and then they did you see the foothold it was shining and the root yeah. setters they kind of sanded down the foothold and polished it yeah. and this yeah. created just such an awkward experience for the athletes because they just looked at it and said oh damn yeah, yeah. and then you are a little bit in a stress situation you become tense and climbing is not so precise anymore and this is the thing as a root setter sometimes it's just enough to kind of scare the athlete even if it's Obviously, not dangerous or whatever, but they, if it just if they get afraid to make a mistake, then you always can, already can separate the good climbers from the best. And this is something, for example, in Bata, we have a whole set. We call it the Emanuela and Valerias. They have no texture at all, but they have this kind of dimples on them. So when you touch them, you have the feeling, oh, this is a good hole, but you cannot pull. You just can move below it yeah, and originally yeah. the super small small screw ones they were made when the the rule changed in the world cup that you have need to have all four contact points taped and sometimes you don't want to have a hole there and because then some of them are more or less without anything and that was the real reason to when, when we created the set but then jackie got off he's always kind of nasty guy and if you if you shape holes there will always be a root setter who will use it in a much worse way than you ever expected. And of course <laughs> you can use it as a handhold. Yeah, but that was not the original idea of it. And also also all our small screw on sometimes in the World Cups, they use it as a whole, but upside down so that you can that you have to hold the double texture part, which is just super hard. And of course, when you when you do observation, it looks like I don't want to do that. But this is exactly the situation as a root setter which you want to create sometimes just to, to see if, if they can do it. Yeah, and, and Rico can kind of attest to this, but I think one of the things that I, I really like from route setting nowadays is just wanting to create any point where an athlete wants, has to make a decision about how they're going to hold something. And so I'll do some really gross looking kind of take all the nicest holds that Enrico brings and then just 
kind of <laughs> get them together so that you just don't know exactly how to grab it. And it's cool because I, I going back to going to Japan and my experience of going back to Japan is that here I feel like there's this really distinct, almost like competition climbing. Here's the box. Everything competition climbing goes in this box. And then here's like commercial climbing and it goes in this box and everything commercial climbing goes in this box. And in Japan, it's kind of like a little blurry there. Like, so it, it makes then what you do in competition climbing, not so much of like this shock of like, okay we've seen stuff like that it even from from the beginning you know like you're standing on on a bad volume from the beginning and i think that's that's really cool that's something that i really appreciate um it's, it's fun fun it makes the experience fun because it's like i i really like when i have to climb and i can't just turn my brain off if i make a mistake uh then then i'm off the wall you know, especially yeah. at the lower level. And it, I think this is where it all kind of comes together because competition route setting is like sometimes awkward positions, stressful positions, surprising things which you never seen before. So this is as a route setter, it's like, welcome to the dark side, you know, but um, and as a coach, it's the opposite way. So of course, when the athlete is in this situation, you want to coach them in a way and prepare them in a way that they are able to handle this kind of stressful situations and still perform at the highest level under these circumstances. And this is, I think, where it all kind of all comes together. This is the game. <laughs> perfect. Well, I think that's a perfect place to, to wrap it all up. We're hitting about an hour here. Benny, I just wanted to thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, awesome conversation. Hopefully, we'll get to chat more. In the Shall future. we ask? Benny back because we didn't talk about training really like about the uh, craftalizer and the uh, train to climb ball I think somebody should ask Benny back okay Benny do you want to come <laughs> we don't you don't have to answer online we will take it off we'll take no it off pressure. so you don't have to feel like you're you got people yeah we, we have to Benny, put it if Benny want to come back. Do it again in the future and I think there are just so many more topics which we can still find some interesting things to talk about I'm pretty sure awesome yeah. well yeah, yeah thank you thank you all for joining again and uh I don't know what time what time is it in Germany right now it's, it's uh, getting dark nine nine after nine yeah Half, uh, yeah nine fifteen so you guys yeah. have an awesome rest of your night and rest of your weekend and it was great chatting with you. And uh, hopefully we'll get to do it again. Thank you so ciao, much. Ciao, guys. Good to see you. Ciao.